Welcome in, everybody, episode 655 of the podcast of Sweeping America, the Air Tour Sports Podcast presented by Betfred Sportsbook. It is Monday, January 23rd, 2022. People, I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody is having a great day, and I hope, for the love of God, I hope you are not, I don't know, I hope I don't have any Cowboys fans listening. I am recording right after the playoffs, another late Cowboy it's not quite a meltdown, but they certainly were in position to make things interesting until Dalton Schultz could not get his feet in bounds. Here's what we're going to do on today's Aaron Torres pod. We are going to jump around a lot. I do actually want to open with a little bit of those NFL playoffs. I have some quick takes on the Cowboys meltdown there um, and why it, it, it's time. I, I've done the, the rant on the Cowboys and the this and the that. We're going to talk about what they should do, what they will do. And I just, I don't even know how Cowboys fans do it. It, it. It's been a long 30 years since the last time you guys were serious Super Super Bowl contenders. We'll discuss that. One quick Joe Burrow thought as Joe Burrow goes to Buffalo and takes care of the Bills. And then from there, we'll get to some of the more normal stuff that we would talk about on a Monday. I do have, I think, a very interesting segment lined up on the Ed Reed situation at Bethune-Cookman. The Pro Football Hall of Famer was hired there. He resigned slash was fired over the weekend. It was a very sketchy situation, but I am here to tell you there is a lot more to the story than maybe meets the eye. And we'll wrap with a little bit of college hoops. TCU smacks around Kansas. Indiana picks up a nice second straight win. Kentucky three games in a row. We will talk about the weekend that was in college basketball. But with that said, let's get to the topic of the day. And the topic of the day, I'll be blunt. Coming into Sunday, my plan was not to talk any NFL. But then we had two very interesting results, very different reasons. And I figured, what the heck? Everybody was on the couch with the family all weekend long, Sunday, uh, Saturday, Sunday into Monday. This is all anybody in the, the world of sports is talking about right now. So let's quickly get to... Two of the games from the weekend. I don't know that there was some amazing takeaway from Casey Jacksonville. Casey wins. Obviously, the big story is going to be Patrick Mahomes' ankle going into this weekend. So we'll discuss maybe what that means going into the Cincinnati game momentarily. Uh, and I, you know, Philly Dallas was or, or Philly uh Giants was just a bloodbath. Don't know what to say there. Congrats to Jalen Hurts and the Eagles going to the a NFC championship game. But with that said. I do have two topics I want to talk about. And the first one, it is the Dallas Cowboys. And so the Cowboys, and I I don't know if I said this on this show, but I'll be honest, going into Sunday, um, I wasn't really sold that there was anything special going on with the Cowboys. I've said all year long, I thought that Tom Brady is, is, I don't know if washed up's the right word, but that it was a disaster in Tampa all year long. He never looked happy. And so when the Dallas Cowboys took care of business on Monday night in Tampa Bay, I wasn't ready to rush and the Cowboys are back and they figured it out and they're going to make a run. I just thought they caught the right team on the right night. And I thought they were going to struggle with San Francisco. Now to their credit, they actually, I thought handled themselves better than I thought they would. The defense stepped up. They made Brock Purdy uncomfortable. Dak wasn't great with two interceptions throughout the game. But they were in position late to win. And so why I bring it up is I do want to get to the final series of the game. Dallas is down 19-12 after everything they've gone through over the last two weeks. The kicker situation, the this, the that, the whatever. They're down 19-12 with the ball about a minute to go. They get lucky to even get the ball back. Remember, San Francisco had the ball, got a first down that would have essentially sealed the game with under two minutes to go. The running back runs out of bounds. Dallas forces a punt that then leads to them having the ball back with under a minute to go. And so I bring it up because Dallas makes a few plays. They pick up a first down and the entire game essentially boils down to one play with about 10, 12, 15 seconds left, whatever it was. Dak Prescott rolls out to his right. Dak Prescott hits Dalton Schultz, his tight end for a first down. Dalton Schultz gets out of bounds and basically At that point, the Cowboys are in position to basically um, have one play to throw to the end zone. There were five seconds left. Um, Even uh, Kevin Burkhardt and Greg Olson, the two broadcasters, they were kind of saying, like, like, do you have a do you have time to, to run one more quick play before you throw it to the end zone? We're going through all these scenarios. 
There was just one problem. And I kind of saw it live, and I was hoping that I was wrong. But Dalton Schultz, in his haste to get out of bounds, didn't get two feet down inbounds. It was insane. And it, it listen, it far from cost the Cowboys the game. But at that point, obviously, five seconds left. A first down is nullified. You lose about 10, 12, 15 yards, whatever it was that he picked up on the first down. And then Dak Prescott drops back to throw a, you know, a, a play that's supposed to be a hook and ladder, multiple laterals. And instead, what happens is the Cowboys, a uh, guy gets tackled, game's over, whatever. And so for the second year in a row, and again, there were a lot of variables. The offense wasn't great. The kicking game, there was a missed extra point early in the game. This after four missed extra points uh, in the in the wild card weekend win over Tampa. But at the end of the day, the Cowboys season came down to late in the game with the clock running, moment in time. You could be great or you could be terrible. It came down to execution, and the Cowboys simply couldn't do it. Last year, there was the rush to the line of scrimmage to try to get the playoff. It doesn't happen. Clock expires in Dallas. This year, Dalton Schultz doesn't get two feet in bounds. Again, to be clear, for the millionth time, it is not to say that if Dalton Schultz gets his feet in bounds, the Cowboys win that game. They would have still had to throw a Hail Mary, convert the Hail Mary, kick a PAT to go to overtime, and then win it in overtime. But why I bring it up is because... It once again proves something that I remember talking about on this show a year ago when the Cowboys lost to San Francisco 49ers. At the end of the day, some of it's on Dak, some of it's on this, some of it's on that, some of it's on Dalton Schultz. But for the second year in a row, it comes down to late game execution. The Cowboys can't do it, and it costs themselves the season against the San Francisco 49ers. And so now... The question is, what's next? And what is next, to me, is the fascinating age-old question of what I always talk about on this show. I, on this show, I talk about what could happen, what should happen, and what will happen, okay? I say it all the time. What could happen? This guy could commit. That guy could transfer there. This, that, the other thing. What could happen what should happen, what will happen. What should happen with the Dallas Cowboys is different than what will happen. And what will happen, I believe nothing. I believe Mike McCarthy's coming back. I believe they're going to run it back. Same core, same group, same whatever, same this, same that. That's not what should happen, though. There's a difference between what should happen, what could happen, what will happen. What will happen, the whole core is going to come back as planned. What should happen, I think, As I said, at this time last year, blow it up, pay the premium for an elite coach, and try to make a run. And why I say that is because the window is right now. And so what I want to do, I want to bring back one of my favorite segments from a year ago. Because a year ago, if you remember, this is one of my favorite segments that I've ever done. And what I said was this. I said, if I was the Cowboys, if I was was Jerry Jones, What I believe they should have done this time last year after the meltdown against San Francisco last year, not even this year, last year, what I said the Cowboys should do, fire Mike McCarthy and offer a three-year, $60 million contract to Nick Saban. Nick Saban, yes, the Alabama head football coach. And if he says no to $20 million a year, you make it 25. And if he says no to $25 million a year, you make it 30. And if he says no to 30, you make it 50. And you do whatever it takes to get Nick Saban. Let me explain why a year ago I said I believed you had to go get Nick Saban specifically as your head coach. The reason why is pretty straightforward. It is because I believe that the Cowboys Super Bowl window is right now. Dak Prescott has paid $40 million a year. You can't get rid of him. You're not starting over. And so you have to make do with essentially the guys on this roster. The thing is, though, about this specific Dallas roster, and I said it a year ago, I said C.D. Lamb and uh, Trevon Diggs, they were both coming up with two years left on their rookie contract. Micah Parsons has three years left on his rookie contract. This is as of a year ago. Now, today, January 23rd, 2022, here is the bottom line. 
you have one year left with CD Lamb and Trevon Diggs on a rookie contract. You have two years left with Michael Parsons on a rookie contract. And so to me, that is important. You're stuck with Dak. You're stuck with the Zeke contract. And you have three dynamic young players that are all on rookie contracts. And so that is why the window is now. Eventually, you're going to have to pay Michael Parsons a lot of money. Eventually, you're going to have to pay CD Lamb a lot of money. But right now, those guys are still cheap. And so because of it, your Super Bowl window was basically this year and next year, the 2023 season. And then after that, the books just start to go crazy with everything that you owe everybody in, in salary. And so to me, why you have to change out Mike McCarthy is because he's not the answer. I actually give him credit. I thought he was fine this year. I thought he did a good job. It's easy to forget early in the year. Remember Cooper Rush? That was a thing. Cooper Rush comes in. Cooper Rush is the quarterback. Jerry Jones says, um, you know, this guy might, it might be a, a, a quarterback battle when Dak comes back. Now it wasn't, but Mike McCarthy, I thought did a good job. I, I thought if I had to give him a grade for the season, it's probably a B plus. I don't think he was elite. I don't think he was terrible. But what I think he taught us again on Sunday night is that when it comes to the little details, the minor things, the things that separate the champions and the non-champions, he doesn't have that under control. And so that is why a year ago I said, go get Nick Saban. Because the one thing about Nick Saban, first of all, your Super Bowl window is 2022 and 2023. Well, Nick Saban's now in his early to mid 70s, okay? Nick Saban is 71 years old right now as I record. He will be 72 in the middle of football season next year. So go sign him to a three-year contract and say, look, this isn't a lifetime contract. We don't need you to be, um, you know, we don't need you to come in and, and fix everything over the over a four or five-year period. We have the roster right now. We need the coach to get us over the top. And so it fits Nick Saban's kind of alignment with when he could potentially win a Super Bowl. And it fits when the Cowboys need a new voice and a new leader in that locker room. Now, ultimately, it was a half-baked idea. It's never going to happen. And I think now, more than ever, Nick Saban's not leaving. He just signed one of the great classes of all time. He ain't going nowhere. But it still comes back down to the fundamental thing. Next year is really the Super Bowl window. Then after that, you got to start paying people. You got to start paying C.D. Lamb. You got to start paying Micah Parsons, Trevon Diggs, whoever. The Super Bowl window is right now. And I don't believe Mike McCarthy can get you out of the divisional round. And so to me, says Nick Saban ain't coming. This is what I would do. Would versus should versus could versus will. What I would do if I was Jerry Jones, I would go hire Sean Payton. And here's why. It's because we know Sean Payton wants to coach. If Sean Payton is willing to interview with the Denver Broncos, which as of right now, my understanding is he's interviewing with the Broncos like tomorrow, like today as you guys listen on Friday, on Monday, excuse me. And so if he is willing to interview with the Broncos on Monday, he's not willing to come to Dallas. He'll go to Denver with Russell Wilson in the same division as Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert. But he won't come to Dallas. Give me a break. He would come to Dallas in a second. Now, it won't happen because my understanding of everything is that Jerry Jones, here's the thing about Jerry Jones. I'll say this. I believe at this point in his career, Jerry Jones prefers to be a celebrity over winning a Super Bowl. And what do I mean by that? Jerry Jones is the most out there, outspoken owner that we have in sports. Jerry Jones does weekly radio interviews. Jerry Jones has his own post-game press conference after the, the, the coach has his post-game press conference. And so it's interesting to me because I believe that Jerry Jones, I think he likes being a celebrity more than he actually cares about winning a Super Bowl. He wants to win a Super Bowl, but to win a Super Bowl, sometimes the owner's got to sit in the back and be quiet and write checks. That's what Nick Saban would require. That's what Sean Payton would require. That's why he didn't get along with Bill Parcells. That's why, obviously, him and Jimmy Johnson didn't get along. And it's interesting. It's ironic that I'm having this conversation because I just finished Jimmy Johnson's autobiography, which came out about four or five months ago. And there was an interesting line in there about why he left the Cowboys. Now, the famous story is that Jerry Jones got drunk one night. This I'm not making this up. He really said this is that after the back-to-back -back Super Bowl wins from Jimmy Johnson, that Jerry Jones got drunk one time, and he said, oh, you know, 
200 different coaches could win a Super Bowl with the roster that we put together. And Jimmy Johnson's like, one, no, they couldn't. And two, we didn't put anything together. I put this roster together. But the point is, is that Jerry Jones at some point started to get jealousy, jealous of the notoriety that Jimmy Johnson had. The famous line that Jimmy Johnson dropped in the book was that Jerry Jones came to him one day and he said, why don't I get to have all, why don't I get to have the fun that you guys do? In other words, when we have success and we win, it's Jimmy did this, Jimmy did that, blah, 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 this and that. And if you look at the coaches that Jerry Jones has had since then, Mike McCarthy, Jason Garrett, Chan Gailey, those guys, they're willing to take a backseat to the owner if that's what it takes to keep their job. Bill Parcells didn't last. Jimmy Johnson got fired. And so why that's important is because I, I, I feel bad for Cowboys fans. I just feel bad for Cowboys fans because I don't think Jerry Jones is going to do what he needs to do, which is fire Mike McCarthy, bring in Sean Payton. And I don't think he does. He should. he's going to do what I would have suggested a year ago, which is go pursue Nick Saban. At this point, Saban's off the table. I get it. That's not what this is really about. What this is about is I don't think you can win a Super Bowl with Mike McCarthy. I understand that he did it 11, 12 years ago with Aaron Rodgers. That was Aaron Rodgers in the peak of his career. And that was many, many, many years ago. And Aaron Rod Dak Prescott ain't Aaron Rodgers. So I could go on and on and on and on and on. That was all just a 15-minute segment for me to say what Jerry Jones is going to do is just run it back and hope for what, what are the, what's the famous saying? Uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's what Jerry Jones is going to do. What he should do, fire Mike McCarthy, go hire Sean Payton. I would have hired Nick Saban a year ago. And when I say hired him, I mean, I would have thrown every dollar that I could at him and make him have to consider leaving the Alabama Crimson Tide. But Cowboys fans, I'm sorry. Cowboys fans, I feel bad. Another tough loss again. I'm not saying if Dalton Schultz gets his feet in bounds that the game is different, but man, oh man, oh man, is that a bummer. Really quickly, I do want to talk about the other game on Sunday. By the way, that whole segment, I did totally off the top of my head. No notes, no nothing. Did it 10 minutes after the Cowboys 49ers game ended. Shout out to Torres. But I do want to switch gears. Hopefully the last segment made sense. Hopefully this one made, makes sense. Because on Sunday, the early game, Cincinnati Bengals go to Buffalo in a blizzard and take care of business, beating the Buffalo Bills by 17 points. I mean, this was a butt kicking of epic proportions as Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals are going to back-to-back -back AFC championship games after beating the, the, the Buffalo Bills. Excuse me. See, now I, I, I bragged about myself how good I was doing, and I'm tripping over my own words. But the point is, is that the Bengals are going to back-to-back -back AFC championship games after a 27-10 to win over Buffalo. And this part I'll make a little bit quicker because I want to get to some Ed Reed stuff. I want to get to some college hoops. But what I would say about Joe Burrow and the Bengals is this. To me, this is one of the most impressive performances I can ever remember. And I'll tell you why. One, Cincinnati's a six-point underdog. Buffalo is expected to win that game. It's in Buffalo. You have snow. You jump out to a 14-0 lead. And keep in mind, and I know everybody knows this, but I'm just going to reiterate it because I think it's absolutely fascinating is that you look at this game. This was a game where Cincinnati was down three starting offensive linemen. They were down three starting offensive linemen, and they end up going into Buffalo, jumping out to a 14-0 lead, holding Buffalo scoreless for the final 25 or so minutes of the game, and walking away with a victory to again, their second straight AFC championship game. And so while this was a team effort from the Cincinnati Bengals, it was. Offensive line was incredible despite missing three starters. The defensive front got after Josh Allen, got after Buffalo. There's issues with Buffalo we're going to talk about in a minute. But more than anything, I do think this does fall to Joe Burrow. Now, again, this is a team effort. It's a team game. It's not to say that nobody else had any role in it. It's not to say that Joe Burrow just put Cincinnati on his back, and it was one play after another, after another, after another. But to me, this was kind of about Joe Burrow, because one thing about Joe Burrow, and this is, you know, I've been hesitant to get as excited about Joe Burrow as everybody else. But one thing I will say about Joe Burrow is that 
he is a guy, I don't know that I've ever seen a player, maybe Tom Brady, maybe Tim Tebow, there, there's a few, but a guy that gets his guys to believe the way that he does, right? It's one thing to have a quarterback with swag, to have a quarterback with moxie, to have a quarterback that believes in himself. We see that all the time. But this guy galvanizes an entire locker room, galvanizes an entire organization. He did it at LSU. He did it last year with the Bengals getting them to the Super Bowl. And he's done it again this year, getting them to the AFC Championship game. And so when I think about Joe Burrow and when I think about the Bengals, but mostly Joe Burrow, I had a thought after this game went final. And that thought was pretty straightforward. It was this. It was if Joe Burrow. So so let me let me backtrack. Okay. So I think right now, if you ask the casual fan, you're sitting at a bar, you're sitting at Buffalo Wild Wings, whatever, and you say, okay, rank your top quarterbacks. Rank your top quarterbacks. I think everybody would say, okay, well, Patrick Mahomes is number one. And then after Patrick Mahomes, maybe Joe Burrow. Probably after Sunday, Joe Burrow's ahead of Josh Allen, but Josh Allen's really talented. This guy, Justin Herbert, Lamar Jackson, even Tom Brady. There's people that still believe in Tom Brady. I'm not one of them. But why I bring it up, I'm going to ask you a simple question. It's going to sound crazy. But if Joe Burrow goes to Arrowhead and beats Patrick Mahomes next week, we kind of have to consider Joe Burrow the best quarterback in the NFL, right? And it sounds crazy. Oh, Torres, you're out of your mind. You're doing your Torres thing. You're going crazy. Just hear me out. Just let me explain. So first of all, Joe Burrow, incredible on Sunday. As I said, almost a touchdown underdog on the road, in the snow, down three offensive linemen, beats Josh Allen head to head. I like Josh Allen, maybe the most physically gifted quarterback I can ever remember. Big, strong, athletic, tough, can run you over, can throw the ball 70 yards downfield. I know he was a play short a year ago. I know he was 13 seconds short against KC in the divisional round a year ago. But at the same time, Show me like, like Buffalo was not very good in the middle to the end of last season, got hot in the playoffs. This year, they were not very good the final five, six weeks of the season. I'm I'm not saying I'm out on Josh Allen. I'm just saying I need to see a little bit more in the games that really matter. But why I bring it up is Joe Burrow gets the win Sunday. But here's what, what else is at play. I think Bengals fans know this, and I know we have a lot of Bengals fans that listen to this show including who day wins, who won the bracket fanatics challenge. I think that's a Bengals fan. Joe Burrow is three and oh, right now against Patrick Mahomes. Joe Burrow won late in the regular season last year against Patrick Mahomes head to head in the AFC championship game at Arrowhead last year. And he beat him in the regular season this year. And so if Joe Burrow goes to Arrowhead again and goes four and oh, in his career against Patrick Mahomes and goes two and oh, in AFC championship games, I think that we got to say that the mantle has been passed for a short time for Patrick Mahomes to Joe, Joe Burrow. And I know some people would say, oh, well, Torres, Patrick Mahomes has a Super Bowl. He does. He has a ring. But are rings a be-all, end-all? Because if rings are the only thing that matters, then Tom Brady's still the best quarterback in the NFL, and I don't think anybody thinks he's the best quarterback in the NFL. I don't think anybody thinks that Eli Manning is the quarterback that Peyton Manning is because they both won two Super Bowls. I don't think anyone thinks that Eli Manning is a better quarterback than Aaron Rodgers because Eli Manning has two Super Bowls and Aaron Rodgers has one. And so I don't think we should hold Joe Joe Burrow against him if he gets to a second straight Super Bowl and he doesn't win. Winning Super Bowls is hard. But if you get to two in your first three years and you go through Patrick Mahomes twice, I think it's a conversation. If Joe Burrow wins next week, 4-0 against Patrick Mahomes, two Super Bowls, same number as Patrick Mahomes, and obviously by the end of this year's Super Bowl, he in theory could have his first Super Bowl win. So I'm not saying it's happened. He's still got to beat Mahomes. To me right now, Mahomes is still the guy. Fifth straight AFC championship game, which is insane for Patrick Mahomes. Congrats to him and the Chiefs. But if Joe Burrow beats him head to head, I think it's time to have a very interesting conversation on Joe Burrow and where he ranks, if he ranks ahead of Patrick Mahomes. Lastly, I just want to say this on the Buffalo Bills. You know, I think the Buffalo Bills, I don't want to say they've been given the benefit of the doubt. But I did. I think I said this in one of the preseason shows. I don't talk a ton of NFL, but I did because of the pre. I did in the preseason. And one thing that I remember saying was, as I always say on this show, two things in life can be true. I understood why the Bills were the preseason Super Bowl favorites, but I also felt like, have we ever really seen a team quite like the Bills be favored in the preseason? 
Because here, here, here's the crazy part about the Buffalo Bills that I don't think anybody really talks about or acknowledges, okay? So when you think about the Buffalo Bills, here's the bottom line. The Buffalo Bills were the preseason Super Bowl favorites this year without ever, this group specifically. I'm not talking about, you know, 30 years ago with Jim Kelly and Thurman Thomas and whatever. The Buffalo Bills, this group, has never won a Super Bowl. They've never played in the Super Bowl. The one AFC championship game they got to was two years ago. They got destroyed by Kansas City in the AFC championship game. And so to me, I thought it was kind of weird. And I understand last year in the playoffs, they were 13 seconds away from winning at Arrowhead, but they didn't win. I thought it was weird that a team that had never been to the Super Bowl as a group, had never won a Super Bowl, had never even won an AFC championship game, was the favorites. And I think it'll be interesting next year to see what the conversation is. This felt like the year where there was all the Buffalo hype. Next year feels like the year where it's going to be, all right, it is time for you to prove it, and we'll see if that happens with Buffalo. But congrats to the Cincinnati Bengals. You are going to your second straight AFC Championship game. We'll be fascinated to see if you can win your second straight AFC Championship game at Arrowhead. All right, so what I want to do, take a quick break. Come back. Ed Reed, did you see this story at Bethune-Cookman? It's insane. We're going to discuss that. Next. All right, we're getting back to the show in a minute. But before we do, I want to welcome back our presenting sponsor, Betfred Sportsbook and the Betfred Sportsbook app. By now, you know Betfred's story. Started in 1967 in the UK. Over 1,600 shops in the UK have come to the United States and made a major splash. They are the presenting sponsor of the Cincinnati Bengals, Colorado Rockies, Denver Broncos. And what I love about working with Betfred, nobody does more for their customers than Betfred does. Okay. I've told you before, but I'm going to keep telling you Cincinnati Bengals games, that Betfred suite is rocking. They had a new year's Eve into new year's day party for the launch of sports betting in the state of Ohio. Shout out to all of you who were there. Obviously beyond that, there is the Denver Broncos VIP tailgates. We have sent listeners of this show to those tailgates, Colorado Rockies first pitch at those games. Betfred does more for their customers than anybody. And here is what they are doing. For listeners of the Aaron Torres podcast, okay, so what you got to do, bet 50 on any game and new users, how about this, get up to $1,000 in free bets. There are no catches. There are no gimmicks. Here's what you need to know. Bet 50 on any game, you get automatically $111 in free bets. But beyond that, you get $200 insurance on your first five weeks as a Betfred customer. So you decided, hey, I'm going to bet this big game. 100 bucks, 200 bucks, whatever, you end up losing it, they're going to insure you for that game. So up to five weeks, up to $200, plus $111 for signing up for Betfred today. You're going to want to do it. Download the Betfred Sportsbook app. Tell them Torres sent you. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, the Betfred Sportsbook. All right, everybody. I'm back. Going to be back. Going to be back. I do want to switch gears, and I want to talk about a story that was, it was just absolutely fascinating from over the course of this weekend, uh, involving a theme that we've discussed a lot on this show over the last couple of weeks, but certainly with a new twist. And that is a pro football legend, a football legend coaching at an HBCU. Over the last couple of months, we have talked a lot about Coach Prime Deion Sanders, was at Jackson State, now at Colorado. But on Saturday and really over the last month, we have gotten quite a twist on that narrative. As Ed Reed, who of course is a football legend in his own right, had been hired at Bethune-Cookman, and on Saturday, after a, I guess you could call it a controversy-filled less than a month on the job, announces that he is stepping away, but is he really stepping away? And essentially, this became a mega, mega, mega story on Saturday. Ed Reed had been hired by Bethune-Cookman. He leaves the school Saturday under very mysterious circumstances. He had some very interesting quotes in the midst of his departure. So let's break it all down and let's discuss. And where I want to start is the obvious, right? Coach Prime set the blueprint on what can be done uh, with the right person, the right coach, the right situation. And it certainly feels like a lot of HBCU schools are trying to um, are trying to replicate the Coach Prime model. We've talked about it before. Eddie George is the head coach at Tennessee State. Hugh Jackson is the head coach at Grambling. Yes, that Hugh Jackson, former Cleveland Browns head coach. Uh, And about a month ago, 26 days, 27 days ago now as you listen, Ed Reed, the Pro Football Hall of Famer, was hired at Bethune-Cookman. 
And so obviously it was done believing that, hey, maybe we can follow the Coach Prime blueprint. Come in, pro football legend, NFL mindset, um, you know, cultivate the relationships to build um, a, a great football program, a great community, something the school can be proud of, all of that good stuff. Unfortunately, from the beginning, this thing seemed, you know, doomed from the start, okay? Just last Sunday, uh, a week ago, you know, 10, you know, nine, eight days ago from when you were listening to this, the first little sign that maybe things weren't going very well happened when Ed Reed was seen on a golf cart. He goes on Instagram Live, and he starts complaining about the setup at Bethune-Cookman and specifically what he inherited in terms of the good and the bad Mostly the bad. Want to read you what he said so there's no confusion. But this was Ed Reed shortly after taking the job on campus. He's actually with his team cleaning up the campus. Here's what Ed Reed said. He said, Prime was not wrong about what he was saying. Again, this is Ed Reed as Bethune Cookman's head coach on Instagram Live. All y'all out here with y'all little opinions are full of crap. But needless to say, I just pulled up to work. We're going to try to help y'all too because I know a lot of HBCUs need help. I'm just here to help first. I see it all too clearly. All of our HBCUs need help and they need help because of the people who are running it. It's broken mentalities out here. And then he continued later on in that Instagram live. I've been here for a week and a half and have done more for more than people who have been here freaking years. And I'm, I'm not even hired yet. Damn shame. I should leave. I'm not even under contract doing this. And so Ed Reed said that two Sundays ago, so probably about eight, nine days from the time you're listening to this, um, and it was very controversial at the time, comes in, as he said, he hadn't even signed a contract, and he's already criticizing the school, criticizing the setup, whatever. And so early last week, Ed Reed did apologize. He said, I shouldn't have said that, you know, shouldn't have put the family business out in public, um, and he did have to apologize. After that, it stays a little bit quiet. We're trying to figure out, okay, is there really a problem? Was it a one-off? Why did Ed Reed say that? Uh, and then Saturday, we, we woke up to kind of a wild story and a wild, unfortunate conclusion to this Ed Reed situation. He releases a statement. It's crazy because I'm apparently on Ed Reed's official mailing list, some, some stuff, you know, some interviews I did years ago. And I see this statement and it kind of blows me away. Basically, it looks as though it's a resignation letter but it doesn't really have the words that are normally associated with the resignation letter. Here is some of what Ed Reed said. He said, Bethune Cookman has been working with my legal team to craft a contract terms with the language and resources we knew were needed to build a successful football program. It's my desire to not only coach football, but to be an agent of change that most people just talk about being. However, after weeks of negotiations, I've been informed that the university won't be ratifying my contract and won't make good on the agreement we had in principle, which had provisions and resources best needed to support the student athletes. I was committed to coaching and cultivating relationship with the university players, community, and fans. It's extremely disappointing. This won't be happening. So that was about 11 a.m. Eastern time on Saturday. He is basically sort of resigning, but not resigning, basically saying the school has not given him what he needs. And he thinks it's best for all parties just to move on. Sad, disappointing, whatever. But then, like an hour after that, we get a, a, a video of Ed Reed addressing his team about his decision or the decision for him to step away. At that point, he's very emotional. At that point, he makes it very clear this is not his decision. Um, and he says some very interesting things. I should mention, by the way, Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, came on to an Instagram Live with him from Colorado, basically said, you know how it is. It's unfortunate, but you got to do what's best for you. Move on. I'll, I'm there if you need me. I'll hop on a plane. But why this is interesting, Ed Reed said some very interesting things that were caught on camera and then shared on social media. And I want to read just some of what Ed Reed said and I apologize for doing a lot of reading right now, but I want to contextualize why this story is so crazy. So this is what Ed Reed said to his team after announcing that he was leaving. He said, I'm not withdrawing my name. They don't want me here because I tell the truth. This hurts because I know people don't care about these kids like I do. And then to me, what I think is the smoking gun in everything that he said, he said, "These there are some corrupt people in this world, some evil people who do not care about the kids like I do. 
I got receipts. There's all sorts of stuff going on around here. To which I say, wow, Ed Reed, I don't want to speak for Ed Reed, but it feels very much like he's saying there is a bigger systematic problem at play other than us getting enough money for a new practice field or a new weight room or whatever. And so what I want to do is kind of contextualize some of this and kind of just obviously share my opinion. And there are a few things that I can say definitively about this situation. Obviously, only Ed Reed, only his closest confidants, only the people at Bethune-Cookman that are checking the books um, know the absolute 100% truth. But what I can tell you is a few things. One, I don't claim to know Ed Reed, okay? I'm not going to say, oh, Ed Reed, yeah, me and him smoke cigar. No. But what I can tell you is a couple things. One, did have the chance to interview him one time and really had a chance to get to know a lot of people who were around him during the Miami days. When I worked at FoxSports.com, I did a huge story on the University of Miami 2001 team that won a national championship. Ed Reed was, of course, the captain of that team and All-American on that team. Maybe the greatest college football team of all time. But I interviewed Ed Reed. I interviewed Phil Buchanan, first round pick of the Oakland Raiders at the time, the then Oakland Raiders. I interviewed Frank Gore. I interviewed uh, Clinton Portis, um, you know, Andre Johnson, on and on. Santana Moss, who was Ed Reed's roommate. And the one thing I learned, Ed Reed ran that. Pro- Ed Reed was essentially the coach, the GM, the, the strength and conditioning coach, the, the star player, everything. I'll tell you a true funny story. I interviewed Larry Coker, the head coach of that national championship team. He takes over for Butch Davis that year. Larry Coker told me that on his first day on the job, Ed Reed said to him, he said, coach, you worry about the game plan. I am going to handle the discipline. I'll take care of everything else. You do what you got to do. Put us in a position to win. I'll make sure these other 84 guys stay in line. And so why I bring that up is because I can't tell you that I know Ed Reed. I can't tell you that we're best friends and we hang out and we whatever. But what I can tell you is I know enough people around him to know a couple things. One. Nobody puts in more work than that guy. Phil Buchanan told me, he said, man, when I was at Miami, I watched more film than when I did in the NFL because Ed Reed dragged me to that facility at 7 a.m. every Saturday uh, when everybody else was out having a good time on the weekends at college. We were watching film Saturday mornings. And so Ed Reed puts everything that he has into the sport. Ed Reed, my understanding is he puts everything into everything that he does. There is no BS. There is no nonsense. There is no this. There is no that. If Ed Reed is putting his name on it, he is giving you 100% of Ed Reed, but he expects that in return. If he's going to be in the film room at 7 a.m. and you're the cornerback playing alongside him, your butt better be in the film room at 7 a.m. alongside him. And so that is one thing that I know about Ed Reed is that if he shows up to a place and he doesn't see the commitment to have success at the highest level, and by the way, I'm sure it's not just Bethune-Cookman. I'm sure it's it's been where he's been an assistant coach. I'm sure it's been where he played. I'm sure it's been high school, college, NFL. If you don't have that same level of commitment as Ed Reed, oh boy, you're going to have a problem with Ed Reed. And that to me is what I see here. I see a school that hasn't had success on the field. I see a school that to me, it appears as though, I don't even want to speak about the school. What I can say is only what Ed Reed is saying, which is that, Uh, It ain't no lie. These facilities aren't where they need to be. There's garbage in my office. That was one thing that he did say on that Instagram live. I showed up. There was garbage in my office. There's garbage strewn around this campus. Have some pride. Again, it goes back to what he said on this Instagram live. He said, uh, you know, we're working to try to help you too, because I know a lot of HBCUs need help. I'm just here to help first. And so when he says he cares about kids, I believe it because he cares about football and he cares about having success in anything you do at the highest level. Don't know Ed Reed, but know enough people to know that that is an absolute fact. Beyond that, what I would say, some of the commentary that he said about the status of HBCUs, about where things are and how they need to be fixed and changed, it was very interesting, right? These are Ed Ed Reed's words, not mine. He said, I'm not withdrawing this name. They don't want me here because I tell the truth. This hurts because I know people don't care about these kids like I do. He takes this step further. There are some corrupt people in this world, some evil people who do not care about kids like I do. And so I think if you just see that, if you just, you you can sit there and say, oh, you know, that's a crazy person. That's just a person that's mad. He didn't get what he wanted. He's not going to do the job. They fired him, whatever. 
I can't speak to if Ed Reed is 100% right, if he's 100% wrong. What I can say is there's a couple interesting things that have come out that maybe speaks to the fact that Ed Reed is saying some stuff publicly that people don't want out publicly, okay? To me, this doesn't feel like just Ed Reed saying this stuff because here's why. There are two very prominent people that have essentially confirmed what Ed Reed said. One was his former teammate, Edger and James. Somebody, I won't say who, but somebody close to this situation sent me a, a Instagram post that Edger and James, who was Ed Reed's teammate at Miami, posted on social media. Here is what Edger and James said. He said, sometimes we're our own worst enemy, Ed Reed. I hate for those kids not getting a chance to witness what makes the great, great. Your vision and the outside support was about to have a greater impact than most people realized, but shrugging shoulders emoji. And this is where it gets interesting. Shout out to Shaq. Yes, he's talking about Shaquille O'Neal. And those other billionaires you had ready to invest in your vision and build new facilities at Bethune-Cookman. To which I say, I'm not accusing anyone of anything. But if one of Ed Reed's best friends is saying, you had people ready to invest in this school and you're being held back, that is a systematic, fundamental infrastructure problem that goes well beyond Ed Reed and maybe well beyond Bethune-Cookman. You know what it reminds me of? We talked about it on the show a few weeks ago. John Calipari is ready to build a new practice facility in Kentucky. His AD won't let him raise money. Or he raised the money and his AD won't let him spend it. Well, it's the same thing here. And you can sit here and say, oh, Ed, uh, Edger and James is Ed Reed's best friend. I find this interesting as well. Edger and James has sent multiple children of his. Edger and James is, is, I don't know him personally, another one. He is an incredible guy. Single father. His wife tragically passed away. Um, he has sent all of his kids to college. One of them is actually going to play basketball at Cincinnati next year. But several of his kids have gone to HBCUs. So if there's one person that you would think wants to see HBCU succeed, it'd be Edger James. He's literally invested his own money into these schools. So to me, it, it can't be a, well, he's just trying to defend his friend. Is he trying to defend his friend or is he trying to tell the truth? Is he trying to elevate all of these schools overall? Because again, Edger and James has literally put his money where his mouth is with his own money, with his own children. Beyond Edger and James, I find it very interesting. This is stuff, the, the problems with money, the problems with finances, HBCUs. I'm not accusing any one person of anything. But if you listen to Coach Prime closely, if you listen to Deion Sanders closely, this is stuff he talked about when he was at Jackson State. I found it really interesting. He did an interview, Coach Prime, with Shannon Sharp, who is, by the way, in, in, in the news at his own right on Saturday uh, or Friday night. He did an interview with Shannon Sharp, Coach Prime. And one of the things he said that frustrated him the most was that there were some financial situations at Jackson State that he wasn't very happy with. Um, he, you know, he kind of said, he's like, how are all of these HBCUs, how are all these athletic departments so broke? And he said he was willing to bring in his own team of, of auditors and people to look into it, to help everyone, to elevate everyone. And he was basically told, no, he was told that, you know, you have to play in certain neutral site games um, for the good of, 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 you know, HBCUs and the SWAC and the MEAC and whatever. And he said, you know, that's, that's fine. We want to do it, but. If we have a home game, we could potentially raise $1.5 million for the school with each home game. So why don't we just play at home? Why are we giving away money to somebody else? And where is that money going? So where is the money going is an interesting conversation that Deion Sanders himself brought up. And I think the one thing, and, and again, I, I spoke with somebody who's close to Ed Reed on Saturday. And he said, like, look, Coach Prime has a way of kind of saying things diplomatically hinting at things without telling you, leading you there without telling you, Ed Reed's just going to tell you. And so this is a sad story. I think there's more layers to it. And I'll close by saying this. On Sunday morning, and I follow Ed Reed on Instagram, so every time he goes live, it pops up on my social media. Um, he was on live on Sunday morning on Instagram. And you know who he was talking to? His former players. I don't even know if you can call it that. He was only on campus for 25 days his former players who were walking around campus without him picking up trash. And so I saw that and maybe it was all for show and all for this and all for that. But you know what it said to me? 
had said to me that Ed Reed in a short time made a major impact on that campus. Um, and it also said to me one other thing. I think Bethune Cookman has some problems. I don't think Ed Reed was one. Going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. All right, everybody. I am back. Good to be back. Good to be back. Final segment of the show. So good to be back. And I do want to wrap with a little bit of college hoops. And so because we went so long on the NFL and the Ed Reed story, I don't think we need to go super long on college hoops. I don't think there were a bunch of major marquee results. And then even the major marquee results that happened, I don't feel like are worth like a super deep dive, right? Like like Houston lost on Sunday in a weird game to Temple. Okay. It's college basketball. It happens. Even the best teams are going to lose four or five times a year. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on a bunch of different games, but there are two or three that I want to get to. Uh, We're going to talk about Indiana because I think what they did this weekend is actually pretty significant. Kentucky picking up a third straight win. We'll hit on that. But where I want to start is Saturday afternoon in Lawrence, Kansas, because Kansas basketball, Bill Self, Rock Chalk, Jayhawk, all-time program, whatever. They came into Saturday coming off of a loss on the road to Kansas State on Tuesday night. We talked about it on Wednesday's show. So you thought that they would give their best effort of the season against TCU. Instead, TCU walks into Fog Allen and whips them like they stole something. Final score in this one, it was a lot to a little. I don't even know what the final score was. What I do know is I turned it on about midway through the first half. TCU was up by 20 points at Fog Allen Fieldhouse. Looking it up now just for fun. Final score in that one, the TCU Horn Frogs. In their first ever win at Fog Allen Fieldhouse, final score, 83 to 60. And so what I think a lot of people are going to do on a day like today, what's wrong with Kansas? I'll be blunt. I don't think anything's wrong with Kansas. Now, right now, They're a game back in the standings behind Kansas State, a team they lost to a week ago. But like I said, I think a lot of people are going to say, what's wrong with Kansas? What I will tell you is a couple things. One, Bill Self's a legend. You can like him. You can dislike him. You know, all the FBI stuff. What did he do? What should he have done? Should he be in trouble? All that stuff. The guy is a great basketball coach. And through the years, I have seen Kansas struggle early in league play. And I think for the most part, even though they're five and two, they are struggling right now. Two losses in back-to-back games, but prior to that, they beat Iowa State by two. They beat Oklahoma by four in a game that they actually trailed by 10 with under five minutes to go. They beat Texas Tech by three on the road. They beat Oklahoma State by two at home. And so I think you sit here and say, Kansas isn't playing very good basketball right now. I also trust Bill Self to figure it out. And to me, Saturday wasn't really about Kansas. To me, Saturday was about TCU. Because what I want to say about TCU going forward is this. I'm not saying they're the best team in the country. I think Alabama is the best team in the country right now this second. I'm not saying they should be a number one seed. TCU has lost a couple games, 15 and four overall. What I am saying is this. TCU, the Horn Frogs, the school you probably know nothing about from their basketball history. You probably didn't know much about their football team before this year. Andy Dalton from a, year, from a decade ago. The TCU Horn Frogs this year, are good enough to win the national championship in college basketball. And it sounds crazy and it sounds absurd. But what I would tell you is you have to remember who TCU is, what they're about, and never forget, I tried to warn you about TCU in the preseason. So if you go back to a year ago, TCU was a team that got into the NCAA tournament as a nine seed. And it's funny because I I, I joked about you probably don't much remember much about TCU basketball from your childhood or from prior to whatever this year. Last year was TCU's first NCAA tournament win since 1987. So last year they get their first NCAA tournament win in 25 years. But then in the second round, in the round of 32, they pushed a really good Arizona team, number one team in the in the West region. They were a number one seed. They pushed them down the wire. TCU lost in overtime, but that was a game that Arizona easily could have lost and TCU could have advanced. Even before the tournament, people forget this. TCU was actually the last team to beat Kansas last year before Kansas went on to win the national championship. Kansas from there won the rest of its regular season games, its big 12 tournament games, and all six NCAA tournament games in the process of winning a national championship. And so TC was the last team to beat them. And then, oh, by the way, they played them a week later and almost beat them again at Fog Allen Fieldhouse. So this was a good team last year. And then in the offseason, 
they returned literally everybody. My buddy Jeff Borzello, I don't know if he's my buddy. He's a good guy. We talk every once in a while. He did a, a, a stat or a survey or whatever over the summer. No program in college basketball returned more production this year than TCU. Nobody returned more scoring, more rebounding, more minutes played than the TCU Horn Frogs. In total, you go back to last year. I am looking at their roster from right now. Their top one, two, three, four, five, six. Their top six scorers from last year. A team that was a nine seed and beat Kansas in the regular season could have beat Arizona in the NCAA tournament. Their top six scorers are all back. And so this was a team that I thought was good in the preseason. Remember, I picked them to make the final four. My preseason final four, North Carolina, that one's kind of looking a little bit, I don't really know what to say, but I had North Carolina, UCLA, Houston, and TCU in my final four in the preseason. And TCU to me is a team that has all the pieces this year. First of all, they have the best guard in college basketball. And if you're not a college basketball diehard, you might not know this name, but Mike Miles is a star. 19 points per game, three and a half assists, 31% three-point shooting. This guy is just a killer. And what I love about him, he doesn't always make all the big plays, but he makes them when they count. There was a couple moments in that Kansas game where Kansas started to make it interesting, cut it to eight, you know, 10, 12, whatever, and Mike Miles would hit a dagger. So they have Mike Miles. They have Damian Ball, a guard that transferred from Memphis two years ago, 12 and a half points per game, five assists per game. Emmanuel Miller, a Texas A&M transfer, 14 points, six rebounds, shooting almost 48% from three. That is incredible. So they have the, the, the guard play. They have the perimeter play. And they're, they're tough down low. They are physical. They are mean. Eddie Lampkin, if you remember, he was the guy that battled with Arizona last year in the NCAA tournament. He's averaging eight points and seven rebounds per game. I like the makeup of this team. Now, to be clear, they're not perfect. They do not shoot the ball well about 30% from the field. But you look at this team, and you look at what they've done this year. They've already won at Kansas. They've already won at Baylor in league play. Beat Kansas State, the only team to beat Kansas State in league play. So here's what you need to know about TCU. Kansas State, as I record right now, is in first place alone in the Big 12 standings, 17-2 and overall, 6-1 and in Big 12 play. TCU beat them. Kansas, first loss at home, broke an 18-19 game home winning streak. TCU did it. Beat Baylor at home. This is a really good team. They're not perfect. Nobody in college basketball is perfect this year. But I'm just telling you, watch out for TCU. I really think that this is a super dynamic team that I think has a chance to be really special come March. And again, remember the name Mike Miles. He is a good one. Really quickly, some other news and notes from college basketball. Um, I want to go ahead and give a quick shout out to the Indiana Hoosiers. And I know we've all had fun with Indiana, Indiana basketball through the years. They've been terrible. I was the guy, the Mike Woodson guy that crushed him for hiring Mike Woodson. They've had a, a, an interesting year this year. They start off playing really well. If you remember early in the year, they beat North Carolina at home in the Big Ten ACC Challenge. They have a couple really nice wins early. They beat Xavier, a win that looks better and better. Um, and then they really struggled. And they really struggled because they dealt with injuries. Their starting point guard, Xavier Johnson, has been out for weeks with injuries. Uh, Race Thompson, their starting center power forward alongside Trace Jackson Davis, has been out for weeks with injuries. He came back on Sunday. But Indiana, while they struggled for a stretch, I would argue is in the midst of their best two-game streak of the Mike Woodson era. On Thursday night, they went to Illinois and smacked Illinois. Final score 80 to 65. It wasn't as close as possible. It wasn't as close as the score indicated. And on Sunday, they came back and beat Michigan State 82 to 69 at home. And so I know on the one hand, people are gonna say, oh, Torres, who cares? Michigan State isn't ranked, whatever. But what I would say to that is listen. Indiana kind of has a history, right, of the second that their fan base gets its hopes up, they do something to absolutely crush them. And they may still, by the way, because they have a game against last place Minnesota on Wednesday of this week. And would it surprise anybody if they went to Minnesota and lost a weird game? No, not at all. But for them to go to Illinois, have a huge win, and then come back and beat Michigan State, that to me is really impressive. And I want to give credit to one guy in particular. That guy is Trace Jackson Davis, their star center, now a senior. I think everybody knows the story. Son of Dale Davis, the former Indiana Pacers. I want to call him a star, but he was kind of a key player in those Reggie Miller years. 
two of the most impressive back-to-back games that maybe we've had all season. 35, nine and five against Illinois on Thursday night bounces back with 31 and 15 against Michigan state on Sunday. But most importantly, he's doing it in a way where he's doing it, where his team needs him. And I'll say this, Aaron Torres media, AT media, we're coming out with our mid season, all American teams this week. Trace Jackson Davis is going to be on those teams because I would argue that there's nobody that means more to his team than Trace Jackson Davis. Now, some of it's the obvious. Leads the team in points per game at 18 and almost 19 a game. Leads the the team in rebounds per game, nine and a half. Three blocks per game leads the team. 61% field goal percent. But here's the thing. With all the injuries that they have, Xavier Johnson has been out the last four games. Race Thompson has missed time. They have needed him in all of these games. Xavier Johnson, by the way, has missed the last seven. I don't know why I said the last four. But they've needed Trace Jackson Davis. And so I want to give credit to Indiana. I don't know if they're going to maintain it. But as I always say, the show is tonight, and I got to give them credit for... I got to give them credit for this, for the last two games. Really quickly, a couple other news and notes. Kentucky, third straight win. Great victory against Texas A&M. I think Texas A&M is a tournament team. Kentucky battled. Um, We've talked about Kentucky a ton on this show. Thought it was a huge win to keep the momentum going. It's obvious. And listen, I'll say this. I actually feel bad for Severe Wheeler, their starting point guard, previously starting point guard. It is so obvious that they're just a better team with him on the bench. And Saturday felt like the first time that John Calipari really acknowledged it. Now, remember, he didn't start against Tennessee. And then the game after Tennessee, Georgia, you could kind of use the excuse of, oh, he was coming back from injury. We wanted to ease him back in. Well, Saturday against Texas A&M, Severe Wheeler played eight minutes off the bench. For comparison's sake, C.J. Frederick, Cason Wallace, and uh, Antonio Reeves, their three-star guards, all played at least 29 minutes. So poor Severe Wheeler, but this is the reality. This is big boy college basketball now. Kentucky gets the win. Antonio Reeves, to me, is the difference maker. One thing I love about this kid, he is absolutely fearless. He could miss his first two, three, four, three-pointers. He keeps taking them, and he'll eventually make them. So shout-out to Kentucky gets their third straight win. Very quickly, I want to shout out a couple more teams. You know, Auburn quietly 6-1 and in SEC play, back-to-back road wins last week against LSU and South Carolina. Now it's going to get tougher for Auburn. They don't have a ton of, like, great wins on their resume. But right now, they're tied with Tennessee in second place. I think everybody in the SEC knows Alabama's number one. Tennessee's right there. Auburn's tied with Tennessee at 6-1 and in second place. Now they play Texas A&M this week. Uh, at West Virginia in the Big 12 SEC Challenge. And then they play a brutal, really about a four-game stretch at Tennessee, at A&M, Alabama at home, and Missouri at home to start February. That's where we're going to learn a lot about them. They still have two games each against Alabama and Tennessee, plus a game at Kentucky, but really respect what Bruce Pearl is doing. Um, You know, like I said, Houston lost on Sunday. I'm not going to make a huge deal of it. Purdue barely survives. But I think that's it for enough. That's enough for today's show. All right. With that said, I think it is time for me to get out of here. Before we do, I want to remind everybody, make sure you're subscribed to the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast, Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music, wherever you listen to podcasts, make sure you're subscribed. Also, make sure to rate and review the show. Go ahead, give us a quick five stars. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, all that good stuff. Make sure you're following on social media at Aaron underscore Torres on Twitter, at Aaron Torres Pod on Instagram. Aaron Torres Podcast questions at gmail.com. Aaron Torres podcast questions at gmail.com. That's all for today's show. It is late on Sunday. I'm about to go to bed. Hope y'all enjoyed the show. It's time for me to go. Shout out to Torrent Craig. Shout out to Rachel, who hates my voice. Shout out to JJ Reddick, you F head. I will be back on Wednesday. All new episode of the Aaron Torres pod.